Aren't you glad he came to you one day when you received the Lord Jesus as your Savior? That's one reason why on Wednesday we'll start our worldwide missions conference. And I hope that you'll plan on being here each of the nights of the conference. We don't, it's just a couple times a year that we ask our congregation to come uh, more than just Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And the conference is one of those times. It's just a highlight uh, for our church and really uh, helps us have a major part in getting the gospel around the world. We'll have uh, four missionary families with us, as well as a pastor from Ecuador who uh, when we took our last uh, summer's missions trip, we worked with and and we've been helping him to help some new churches get started there in Ecuador, as well as Dr. Lou Baldwin. And that'll all start Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and then Thursday night at 7, and then Friday night at 7. We're going to take Saturday off. We'll have that the Greater Vision, Ethan Doherty Memorial Concert Saturday night, and then Sunday morning and Sunday night we'll be back in Missions Conference. Sunday night at 6 o'clock we'll meet in our, in our the brand new fellowship hall. Should be completely done and ready, and we'll have our service in there in conjunction with our international banquet, and we'd ask you just to make a meal from uh, maybe your heritage or from some place around the world that you'd like to visit one day and bring that and we'll all eat together and then we'll have a brief service to conclude our missions conference. You saw in the video the announcements uh, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday we'll also have food uh, at six o'clock each night so that you can just come straight from work, eat, uh, be in the services. We'll have things going on for the children each night, and we'll have a different missionary with the kids each night. And so just a wonderful week. We want you to be a part of that. And here we are today, three weeks into a new year, and I've tried to encourage us uh, to start the year on a spiritually high note. Uh, three, we uh, three weeks ago now, I preached on uh, first things first and the importance of beginning the year uh, with the first things uh, in their place. I, I spoke about the first day of the week and about the first part of our day, making sure that we're spending time with our Savior and walking with Him. Uh, last Sunday, I preached on having a healthy balance between our family life and our church and spiritual life and then our work life. And if you missed last week, for any reason, I would encourage you to listen to that message online. In fact, all the messages you can find at the church website. Next Sunday, we'll be concluding our missions conference where uh, Dr. Lou Baldwin will be challenging us uh, to be involved with reaching the world with the gospel. And so today, I want to help us uh, just have a healthy motivation, have a, a healthy approach to this life that we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. So a little bit different, uh, a little bit different uh, format today, but I would like us to stand together. Uh, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning, and we'll read verses 11 through 14. And if you're able, would you stand together? And let's read those four verses together, and then we'll have you be seated and go right into the message this morning. And the Bible says there, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 11. Ready? For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And you can be seated, and let's pray. Father, bless this morning. And Lord, you've given us a beautiful day and uh, just a wonderful service thus far uh, with singing and, and praise. And Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy. But Lord, when we come to this time of the preaching of your word, would you uh, help us to, uh, Lord, to focus, help our hearts to be quiet and still before thee. And Lord, would you speak to us this morning? 
in, like only you can, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One of the reasons among many that we serve the Lord and try to live a life and a lifestyle that not only lines up with His Word, but is also pleasing to Him, is because uh, we will stand before Him one day and give an account of our lives. Now, we don't hear that preached on much in our day because uh, it is uh, not necessarily, it doesn't fit in with the political correct uh, way that uh, so many churches are going. Certainly we serve Him because we love Him and we live for Him because we love Him. And the Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. And so uh, that's a wonderful thing. But we also serve the Lord, if not in some small part, because one day uh, the Bible tells us we will all stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.10 the Bible tells us we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And when we appear before him, we will give an account for that good or that bad done uh, in our lives. I like the way Paul put it back in our passage that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, I like how uh, he tells us that, uh, it, look at verse 11 if you would. He said, for an other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so Paul uh, tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ at our salvation became the foundation upon which the rest of our life is built. Uh, he is the chief cornerstone and he is the foundation of our life. We spend the rest of our lives either building upon that foundation with good, solid work and material like gold, silver, and precious stones stone or with a more unstable material, less permanent, more temporal material like wood, hay, and stubble. I like what he said. Look back up at verse 13. He said, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And I like that in verse 13, he tells us of that day when all our work will be made manifest. In other words, it'll just be made openly known. Uh, it'll be made uh, open and known. The day is the judgment seat of Christ, and on that day, uh, God is going to try our lives by fire. He's going to uh, set a spiritual match uh, to our life, and fire, the Bible says, purifies things. And, and in this case, the fire will, will reveal uh, what sort or what kind of life that we live. Anything that was built with wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up, but the gold, the silver, and the precious stone will remain. And then the Bible says we'll be rewarded according to what remains. Now, when I first got saved, uh, this day terrified me. And by the way, it, it's not a light thing. It's going to be a very serious thing for every believer. But what terrified me was that on that day, uh, there would be a big projector and a big screen and it would show uh, every bad thing I'd ever done in my life uh, for all to see. And uh, through study of scripture and through uh, growth in the Lord, I understand and realize that's not uh, what's going to happen, but, but uh, how our lives and works will be made manifest is after that judgment and after the wood, the hay, and the stubble is burned away, uh, we will be embarrassed at what is left in many cases. Matter of fact, the Bible says the lack of reward will be the embarrassing part. We'll be disappointed when we have nothing to lay at the feet of our Savior. Now, what he says in verse 13 is very interesting and very important for us to understand understand because he says the thing that will determine what gets burned up and what doesn't is what sort it is. Look back there at verse 13 again where it says the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
not how much there is of it, uh, but what sort it is. And what sort it is has to do uh, really with the quality of the work. Or uh, I like to think of it, I want to make sure I'm living a life that builds with gold, silver, and precious stone. Uh, I think a lot of stuff done in the lives of Christians in general will burn up on that day. But I want us to make sure whatever we do here will be the sort, will be the quality, will be the kind of life and the kind of work that will be rewarded. I want to be rewarded at my judgment seat uh, experience when I stand before the Lord. I want uh, my wife and children uh, to have something to be rewarded uh, for, and I want you uh, to be rewarded at your judgment seat of Christ as well. Now, later in the book of 1 Corinthians, go down to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would, and look at verse 16 to begin with. Because later in the book, Paul gives us some keys to what makes the difference between what sort of life and what sort of work will be burned up, the wood, the hay, and the stubble, and what sort of work, what sort of life will remain and be rewarded, and that's the gold, the, the, the precious stone. And, uh, and he tells us the difference here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. Look what he said there. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Paul uh, was reminding of the call of God on his life. And he said, Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Look what he said in verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly... He said, if I serve God, if I preach as God has called me to preach, if I live this life for him willingly, he said, I receive a reward. By the way, there's, lot, there's, there's not only uh, the eternal reward that we're talking about, those, those crowns that believers who are rewarded will receive at the judgment seat of Christ. There's certainly reward to be had in this life. There is fulfillment when we live a life uh, for the Lord and when we serve Him. And there is joy to be had in this life. There's lots of rewards. The reward is not just once we leave this earth and once once we're in heaven and once we uh, have the judgment seat of Christ. But there is certainly joy to see as we see people get saved. Uh, but Paul was also talking about that eternal reward. He said, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. And I like that because uh, Paul gives us a, a key for us to be able to know the difference. Paul said, if I preach willingly, not of necessity, but willingly, he said, I'll receive a reward. I read that and really it reinforced for me and what I'd always tried to practice as a Christian and as a pastor and, and as a father and as a husband for all these years. God is not only concerned about what I'm doing in this life, Though he is concerned about that, he's concerned about my internal health, he's concerned about my relationship with him, he is concerned about, uh, about what we're doing, but even more than that, as we serve him, he's also concerned about our attitude and our motive when we're doing it. He wants us to serve him willingly. He wants us to want to live for him and to want to serve him and to want to have a life that's pleasing to him. You see, God gets no glory when we just are simply like robots uh, who are programmed uh, to do uh, what we're told to do. Uh, he certainly doesn't get any glory from that. He wants you and I to want to live for him. That's why God never makes anyone get saved. 
uh, he, he'll give us plenty of opportunities. That's what this missions conference is all about, is to give opportunity to all of these countries around the world that don't have a clear presentation of the gospel, but he won't make or force anyone to get saved. Uh, this idea that God chooses who gets saved and who doesn't is so contrary and foreign to the word of God. He will not choose for us. He wants you to choose willingly to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior because God gets glory when you and I choose his son and choose the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same way with serving him. He gets glory when we choose to serve him willingly. And I began to study and began to look in God's word. I looked up the word willingly, kind of did a word study of the word willing and willingly. And I was amazed at some of the attitudes that we have, uh, not only in our lives, but also in the word of God as we serve the Lord. Uh, we act sometimes, and I'm talking about believers in general, we act sometimes like we're doing God a big favor uh, by whatever we do for him. It's for his uh, benefit, and he ought to just be happy with what he gets. Uh, we're doing him a favor by uh, being here this morning or by singing in the choir or by serving as an usher or a greeter or by teaching a class or by showing up for visitation. The truth of it is God does not need us to do anything for him. Uh, it is not, it's not something that uh, he can't get his work done in his kingdom is kingdom work. He can get it done with other people if we're not willing, with other churches if we're not willing. And so uh, there's an interesting uh, exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees. If you take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 19, it's interesting uh, to me. Uh, but we need to change our mindset from it's something that is benefiting God or we're doing God a favor to the fact that we're given a wonderful opportunity to serve him. What an opportunity we have uh, to live for him. And he gets glory. Uh, and the only way we'll be rewarded is if we do whatever we do willingly. Look at verse 39 of Luke 19. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And if you remember, this is uh, where uh, the Lord was entering Jerusalem in the days leading up to his crucifixion. And during his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, his disciples were crying, Hosanna. Uh, they were praising him and rejoicing. They were laying down those palm branches uh, before him. And the Pharisees just couldn't stand it. They just could not stand the fact that here people are excited about the Lord and, and, uh, and are following him and worshiping him and actually believe what he has said to them. And so they told the Lord Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Look what he said in verse 40. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And so the Lord said, hey, if I wanted to get glory and praise, I could have these stones do the job. We could fill a choir with, with, with the heavenly stones that could sing, but God doesn't get glory from that. Uh, God gets glory uh, when his creation, those of us who are saved by the grace of God, willingly lift up our voices in praise and worship uh, to him. And uh, by the way, this will change your whole outlook on serving God. The fact is, uh, sometimes we have this spirit of, well, I have to do this, or I'm being pressured to do this, or I'm being expected to do this. The fact is, none of us have to serve him. Uh, we get to serve him. Uh, we don't have to work in the nursery or, or work in other areas of ministry. We have an opportunity to serve him and to serve God's people. Hey, it's not that we have to come back tonight. 
It's that we get to come back. We have the privilege, the opportunity to serve him and to come back and to worship him and to live for him. I get to willingly uh, build on my foundation of the salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, gold and silver and precious stones. In fact, this whole idea should be freeing to the child of God. It should be exhilarating the fact that it's not about what is expected of us. It's not about an obligation that we have to fulfill. It's not anything any of us have to do, but it is an incredible opportunity that we're given to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and it is our blessing and our opportunity uh, to get to do that. By the way, I was thinking about this as I was studying this. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, even preachers can slip into bad reasons and bad spirits and bad attitudes and poor motives for serving him. Look what Peter said. Uh, and Peter was speaking, especially in this case, to the preachers, uh, those teachers, those uh, that were the leaders in the early church. And he said in verse 2, he said, Feed the flock of God which is among you. And I'll tell you, that is probably at the top of my priority list when it comes to every service and every class and every time we gather is, boy, we want to feed the church of God uh, spiritually. We want to feed you with God's word and give you the tools, the resources, the knowledge, uh, the, the word of God to be able to help us to grow and be able to help us to serve him. But look what he said. He said, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. He was reminding them, you've been called to lead, and so uh, take that leadership. But look what he said, not by constraint, not because you feel pressured to do so, not because you feel an obligation to do so. He said, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And so God told pastors, Peter told the pastors to serve him, not because it's a job, uh, but not because we feel like we have to, and certainly not for money's sake. Serve me, he said, because these are my sheep, and because I love them, and I want you to love them, and I want you to care for them, and I want you to feed them, and I want you to lead them, and so I want you to serve them willingly. And it is certainly a privilege uh, to be a preacher, to be a leader in the work of God. And it's something that we all ought to do uh, willingly from a heart of thanksgiving. Uh, take your Bibles, go to Philemon. Uh, Philemon, if you would. In fact, we'll put it on the screen up here, verse 14 there. I'm going to read that verse, and you can read that, uh, and then I'm going to give you the backstory of that. But without my mind, Paul is writing uh, to a believer, uh, a, a businessman, uh, so to speak. He said, but without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. And what Paul is talking about here is Onesimus who was a servant of Philemon's. Uh, he worked for Philemon. And it appears that he stole from his boss and he ran away to Rome where he crossed paths with Paul in prison. And it was there, Paul's ministry there in Rome. He was witnessing, he was preaching God's word. He was telling anybody who'd listen about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it just happened that Onesimus uh, got saved there. And Onesimus became a blessing to Paul. And through the course of their relationship, uh, Paul found out uh, how Onesimus came to be in Rome. And uh, Paul wrote to Philemon, that's what the, the book of Philemon is, and Paul asked Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to let him stay with Paul and to continue helping Paul. But I like what Paul said. He said, I don't want you to do it because you feel that you have to. 
He said, I don't want you to forgive him and, uh, of his debt and let him stay here because you feel like you owe me or because uh, you feel obligated to. He, he said, don't do it because you feel obligated, the old guilt trip. Uh, he said, I don't want you to feel like I'm putting a guilt trip on you. And boy, there are a lot of folks in a lot of churches do what they do because of a, a guilt trip that someone laid on them. And I just want to say, however God's work gets done is good, but it's a whole lot better for all of us. It's a lot better for me. It's a lot better for you. It'll be a lot better at the judgment seat of Christ if what we do for him is not done out of guilt, is not done out of a sense of necessity or responsibility or obligation but if it's done because we love him and we willingly want to serve him and give of our time and give of our talent and give of our treasure to his honor and to his glory and to his work and so that's what Paul said to Philemon he said Philemon look he said I don't want you to do it uh, I don't want you to feel like this is an obligation he said, I want you to do it willingly. And I want to say this, he was talking about forgiving Onesimus a debt. And he was talking about being willing to forgive him personally as well. And oh, how important it is, you and I ought to be willing to forgive uh, those who maybe have done uh, us wrong or maybe something we've perceived as having been done wrong. More Christians than ever before are walking around in bitterness, holding grudges. Uh, and by the way, when you hold bitterness, it affects every area. It'll affect you emotionally, mentally. It'll affect you physically. It affects us spiritually. And yet we're holding grudges because we refuse to forgive someone who we feel has done wrong uh, to us. And I'm just saying from Paul and from the book of Philemon that we ought to willingly forgive. We ought to be willing uh, to, to forgive and to move on in our lives. Even back in the Old Testament, it was with a willing heart and a willing spirit that God's people were encouraged to serve him. In fact, Ezra chapter 1, if you want to turn there, when Ezra led in the restoration of the temple and they asked God's people to get involved and to take a part and they, they asked them uh, to be involved, there was only one stipulation that they gave. And they said, whatever you do or whatever you give, here's the only stipulation, is that it's done willingly. It is that it's done with a willing heart. Look at Ezra chapter 1 and verse 5. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. Look at verse 6. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver. They were giving them the tools and the materials that they would need to not only be able to make the journey and to be able to take care of themselves but also to rebuild the temple of God. And so they gave them vessels of silver with gold, with goods, and with beasts and with precious thing beside all that was willingly offered. You know, it's healthy. It's healthy for the believer to be involved and to be engaged in the work of God through their local church. That's just, that's just normal, healthy Christianity. But it's healthy also to give, but do it willingly. Our willing giving is something that the Bible says God loves. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7. We'll show it on the screen. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. What's the next little phrase there? For God loveth a cheerful giver. Hey, let's get rid of that old adage that might have worked well decades ago. Uh, the old timers used to say, we got to give until it hurts. You know, that's not a biblical principle. 
uh, because what we ought to do is give until we bring a smile uh, to the face of God, until uh, we're willingly obedient uh, to his plan, uh, his plan for financing his work, for financing the work of God and getting the gospel all around the world. And when we do that willingly in the right heart and spirit, it brings pleasure. He loveth that cheerful giver. And we need a revival in our churches of willingness on the behalf of the congregation. In most churches, it's been calculated that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And you can see how out of balance that is and really how unhealthy that is for the 20% uh, that are doing more than probably they need to or should do or, or God wants them to and, and the, the, how unhealthy that is for all the work that needs to get done in the work of God, uh, not just in our Jerusalem, but all around the world. Uh, now, thank God uh, that uh, we're not average. God's done, given us uh, wonderfully willing people. The problem is that is so few believers who will ever actually receive a reward and a crown. If only 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work, and I wonder how many of those 20% are doing it because doing it grudgingly. Uh, doing it grumbling about the other 80%. Well, brother, so-and-so could be doing this. I don't know why I get stuck doing this. Hey, that's not the spirit that's going to receive, that's going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, that's not even the spirit that's going to be rewarded in this life with joy and with fulfillment. And, and so you can see how uh, we can get this thing so out of whack that not only when the judgments, not only is God's work not getting done, and not only are we not involved and engaged, but when we do stand before the Lord and, we, and that fire is put to our life that we've built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that everything's going to be burned away. And there's going to be no reward uh, to give uh, to the Lord. Now, thank God he's given us a church of willing people, willing to serve, willing to be faithful, willing to work, willing to give. And oh, how we need to model this. I'm talking to moms and dads now. I'm talking to future moms and dads now. I'm talking to grandparents now. Oh, how we need to model this willing behavior, this willing engagement in the work of God. How we need to model that in front of our families. We're teaching by our examples to our children and to our grandchildren how we serve and how we go and how we give all from a willing heart. And let me close with this. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus Christ willingly went to Calvary for you and I? Aren't you glad that he didn't get halfway through and it got a little tough? And there were plenty of times where it got tougher than, than any of us will ever know or understand. But he willingly suffered and died. The great hymn says he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, but he stayed on that cross. In fact, Matthew 26, 53 says, Thinkest thou that I cannot even now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. He said, I can get out of here anytime I want to. He said, I can get off this cross anytime I want to. You see, nobody took the Lord Jesus' life. He willingly laid it down for you and I. In fact, we'll close with John 10. Look at verse 17 and 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And you can infer in that uh, he obviously willingly gave it down. He obviously got on board with, with his heavenly father. Only one time where it even there was a sense that he wasn't, that, that, and, and I think that doesn't mean he didn't want to go. Uh, he understood the separation from his heavenly father. Where in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, he said not, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's where he said, Lord, I'm willing to go. I, father, I'm willing to go. And look what he said there. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. 
This commandment have I received of my Father. Hey, thank God. The Lord Jesus willingly went to Calvary, laid down his life, stayed on the cross for you and for me. Boy, we ought to, we ought to be willing to give ourselves to him, shouldn't we? We ought to be, we ought to be willing to uh, be a little more engaged in his work. We ought to be willing to be a little more enthusiastic about the opportunities he puts in front of us to serve him and to uh, be able to uh, do something for him. And I wanted to ask this, have you trusted that willing Savior? As willing as he was to go to the cross, have you placed your faith for heaven in that willing Savior who died on the cross for you. Let's pray together. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Nobody looking around for this uh, very private, important time, uh, both for believers, those of us who know the Lord as our Savior. What an important time for us as we begin a new year to examine our hearts and to kind of just think about our spirit and our attitude. Uh, has it been a spirit of willing engagement and involvement and service? I mean, when, when you have that willing spirit, when, when Sunday afternoon rolls around and the AFC championship game is just at halftime, but it's time to go to church, uh, we, you know, we're excited about that. We're enthused about that. And we willingly give of our time and give of our presence uh, to the Lord. And uh, so maybe there are believers that say, Preacher, I, I've kind of slipped back into, a, uh, into an unhealthy approach and an unhealthy attitude and an unhealthy spirit when it relates to uh, my, my Christian life and, uh, and living for the Lord and, and, uh, and the serving Him. And certainly this invitation is, an, is a great time to kind of hit a reset button for the believer and to say, you know what, it shouldn't be that way. I'm not going to let it be that way. Uh, not only because I'm not going to enjoy serving him in this life, but there will also be no reward. And I'm telling you, when we're standing before him and we see we see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one we've served all these years, every child of God is going to want to have something to lay at his feet. We're going to want to have something to give back to him. We're going to want to have something to show our Savior of the willing life that we wanted to live for him. And so an important time for believers, but a, a very important time for those who do not know for sure heaven's your home. I wonder who'd say this morning, preacher, I don't know for sure I'm saved. I don't have that peace in my heart would you let me pray for you? Is there anybody like that? Would you lift your hand anywhere in the auditorium? And I don't see any. Let's stand together then. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father, help us this morning as we conclude this service with a time of introspection, with a time of uh, looking inward. And Lord, would you help us to have that willing heart and that willing spirit Lord, help us to hit the reset where so oftentimes we do what we do out of guilt or out of obligation or out of a sense of, uh, of pressure, peer pressure. Lord, may it be because we fall in love with you and because we have a willing heart looking, looking to, uh, Lord, eternity when we'll stand before you one day. And so, Lord, help us as we do. Speak to every heart in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Brother Jason's going to sing. And as he does, as God has spoken to your heart, you come, you come. Home to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever Play.
Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender. And we're so grateful that you willingly love us, went to the cross for us. Lord, now help us as we go out and try to serve thee. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated for just a moment. And I do want to let you know tonight, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our deacons' uh, families, uh, Jamie Lettrick, used to be Jamie Bowman, uh, she graduated from the Christian school here, what, Kate grew up here, and, and uh, her and Lucas lived here for a while as in the early days of their marriage, and they're up in West Virginia now. Uh, his dad is a pastor. They moved there to help him, and, and so, uh, but uh, she just had all kinds of health related problems and lately some real severe problems so much so that she's had to move back for periods of a time just to get healthy they've got a little boy bruce and just put a lot of pressure on uh, their family and and uh, she uh, the the procedures that she needs they found a specialist they have identified what needs to be done and and even just the preliminary work has provided some relief and some uh, some apparent success in healing uh, but it just it's not included in their insurance and so I want to I just feel led I want to be a blessing to this young family and so tonight after the service we'll take a free will offering and uh, nobody's again nobody's obligated cheerful givers nobody's obligated to do anything uh, but we do want you to express your love and if God would lead you you'll have that opportunity tonight and then we'll send that to them just to be a help and an encouragement also tonight we're, we're preaching Preaching on the, the Holy Spirit, and tonight we're looking at walking in the Spirit. What does that mean? What's it mean to walk in the Spirit? And we're going to look at that tonight and uh, look forward to having you. Andrew, would you come close the service? Let me get to the front. Love to greet you on the way out, and it's good to see you here today. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll close in prayer. And as you're standing, I do want to remind you on your way out today, if you're a guest, we have a special gift just for you. And then two things you can stop by at the Welcome Center. One, you purchase your tickets to the Ethan Doherty Memorial Concert coming up this Saturday, and all the proceeds that come in for that go toward the Ethan Doherty Fund, uh, which supplies uh, missions efforts. And then also you can go to the Welcome Center uh, after every service from now until February the 11th to register for the marriage retreat. You can also go online and do that, but it's only four. $40 will reserve your spot, and uh, spots will be filling up. And so we've got a lot of new churches, folks from around the Gulf Coast will be joining us. And we'd love for you to come. Even if you've only been a part of our church for a short amount of time, come on out to that great opportunity to get to know people and uh, let your home be helped by some great teaching uh, centered and focused on having a godly marriage. And so you can stop by the Welcome Center and have both those things, get those done, and uh, make sure you stop by and do that after the service. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for the day you've given to us. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lord, just for the wonderful challenge we heard this morning, and uh, Lord, I pray that you'll just bring us back safely tonight to hear the sermon that Pastor has prepared on the Holy Spirit, and Lord, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts even now for that, and uh, Lord, I pray that you'll be with uh, Jamie, and be with Lucas, and Lord, the electric family. Uh, Lord, may our church be a blessing to them through the offering tonight, and then Lord, I pray that you'll begin to prepare our hearts for the missions conference coming up uh, later this week, starting Wednesday night. Lord, the missionaries that will be in, Brother Baldwin, who will be preaching and lord may you just revive our church's heart uh lord light a passion a fire in each of our hearts to reach the world with the gospel and lord we love you so much and we thank you brings back safely tonight at six in jesus name amen